over your career and your experience, what was the most difficult part of your job? Yeah, I think I think the big the difficult part of the job is being able to present to federal prosecutors logically and systematically your case and close it down, right? Close, put a lid on that case and the evidence and say, you must prosecute this. It's a difficult piece because a lot of times as an agent, you get lost. You know, you get lost amongst, hey, this is exciting. Look, they, they make movies about the job I did. They make movies about it. And it's that good. It's that good of a job. Once you get to the point where you understand what the proofs have to look like and how they have to fit into that federal crime, and not saying fit in like, in other words, hey, we just manipulate them in, then you become a better agent and the job becomes less difficult. There's a lot of people that go through their career and never learn that. They just are always off on the shiny nickel chase. So I think the hardest part of the job for me and for the regular normal FBI agents that I was is just staying focused. Staying focused on the crime at hand and collecting the evidence and going wherever the evidence led you. Not fitting the evidence into the crime, mm. but taking the evidence. And sometimes there was many times for as many cases as I made, there was many times that I would just say to a prosecutor, hey, and, I, and we I was I would talk to my prosecutors every day, sometimes five times a day. And I would say, Look, I don't think we have enough. I don't think it makes sense. I don't think this guy did it. Or I don't think this is, we're going down the wrong path here. We need to be going down this way. So mm. that's the difficult job is kind of swallowing some pride, especially coming out of the military. Mm. I came out of the military, I was doing some crazy stuff. Yeah. Right. Stuff I'll never talk about. I mean, I think Sheila probably knows more than anybody else. My wife. Right. But stuff I'll never be able to talk about. So then you come into this and you're kind of like dealing with, you know, a, a brand new uh, wire fraud where the guy ripped off one hundred and ten thousand dollars. But you're, you're actively pursuing it. You realize you don't have enough evidence for one hundred ten thousand dollar fraud. That drives you crazy. Yeah. That's the difficult part. Right. But then you get to the point where you say, well, I'm only going to go where the evidence takes me. Mm. And you'd be surprised <clears> at how many avenues that opens to the most important thing in the FBI, source development, human, what they call human intelligence, being able to sit with someone and say, look, you know, you've come, you've owned what you did. It's time to become a part of mm -hmm. Team America and it's time to do the right thing. And there's time for you to do that. That's a tough conversation. But the word I used to tell them, the worst day is this day. When I have the handcuffs on you, this is the worst day of your life. But we're going to get better starting this afternoon when you start telling me, because you're going to feel like I'm your preacher mm -hmm. and I'm your therapist and <laughs> I'm everybody in between. And we're going to go with this and we're going to take your information. And if it's good, we're going to work with it. So that's the best part of the job. What was the mix for you as far as work nationally versus internationally? So I would say probably different time periods of my career. Uh, there were times when international was a hundred percent. Um, there was times when domestic was a hundred percent. You know, and so, uh, but I would say overall, it's probably a 50-50 mix. If I looked at my 20 years, plus my years before, plus my five or six years, when it was kind of a hybrid situation, I'd say it's a 50-50 it's mix, 50-50 split. Um, you know, I was better versed at being able to, I had more contacts overseas than most people did, um, just because I was there. So I would be able to kind of say, hey, I think I can run with this because I think we'll be able to get more effective and efficient information. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have to serve what they call MLATs. So they're like, uh, you know, basically they're, they're requests for international banking accounts. Or I would be able to kind of cut through that and get that stuff quicker. And then we can kind of review and see what the deal was. That was based mm -hmm. on context. So I would say the mix was probably definitely, I would say overall 50-50, 50-50. At any point were you considered CIA? <laughs> Julian asked that same question. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, listen, you cross over, right? So sometimes you're not even sure what you're doing. <laughs> like, I mean, you're really? kind of like, well, that guy's over there and that guy's there. I kind of know that guy, but I really don't know that guy. But I'm talking to both of them about, you know, the same issue. So you got to assume. And, and then basically being recruited out of the Army by the CIA and the Bureau at the same mm -hmm. time, you know, you start to, you, they, don't, they don't lose track of that. They know the people they talk to and they know the people that they were looking to kind of, um, you know, nurture and bring along in the hopes right. that they would come and, in, in, you know, serve um, as a case officer somewhere, you know, uh, so it's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic, but I, I don't know, but I'm sure it happened. <laughs> but I'm sure you worked with CIA, active CIA that overseas or wherever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a lifeline. They're a lifeline. 
And this was was this mostly this was mostly post nine eleven, correct? Mostly post nine eleven. I had okay. I, I probably could think of at least one job pre nine eleven that was totally different. It wasn't a terrorism based job. It was a it was a believe it or not, it was a um, like a complex financial fraud case. Mm. Um, and so we had some interactions there. Uh, public corruption will always kind of you'll see some things in public corruption where um, <clears throat> it it ties back to international you know accounts and right. or dealings right um but yeah after 9-11 it became all about um following the money you know trying to reduce uh the number of those here that were looking to do harm and then trying to decentralize those there that were looking to do harm so right. that became the focus mm. and like i said we started talking so much more and communicating so much better and i felt like at that time the leadership was better because they understood their mission they had to actually sit back and do the job, not worry about, well, if I do this and I write up this and say, you know, oh, maybe I'll get promoted to this level. That right. thing, that wasn't happening as much. Mm. I had one interaction with Zuckerberg. I'll tell you a quick story. Oh, really? So we have a, we have a, a group of, of guys and girls um, that are all service academy graduates. Each year we take a trip and we kind of learn some good stuff. So back years ago, I was still in the bureau. Um, we went out to Seattle and we got a chance to visit Google. We got a chance to visit Facebook and, and we had a great time. We met a lot of good people and we got briefed by Zuckerberg himself and everybody's telling me, Diorio, shut your mouth, shut your mouth, shut your mouth. I can't, I, I have a hell of a time shutting my mouth. So there was a, there was this case or, or not a case. I shouldn't say it, but there was always this urban legend in the city of Newark, New Jersey. In fact, where we believed that, Facebook provided, or it, whether it be Zuckerberg himself or Facebook as a, an entity or some LLC provided to the city of Newark $100 million for their education system. At the time, Cory Booker, who's now a U.S. senator from New Jersey, was the mayor of Newark. And there were always allegations. Anytime you have a, this, a city like Newark or Trenton, there's always allegations of corruption, how that person got there, you know, what their background is, whether they were a gang member or who they were. Always that. So you always, I always filtered that out, you know, along the way. But for some reason, I just was tempted as hell during this meeting. And so he was like, any more questions? And everybody, I could feel the eyes on everybody. I said, hey, any idea where that hundred million went that you gave to Cory Booker? And he just walked out. No fucking way. Holy shit. And everybody was like, you asshole, you know? And I'm like, well, and I caught some shit back in the bureau because I was still in the FBI. And they're like, hey, we heard about this thing because I, I think he might have called somebody that he knew in the bureau. And I got called in. You know, I got put on the carpet and did you say it? And I've never been one to say, no, I didn't say it. I absolutely. And they said, like, that's pretty funny, but you're suspended. You know, so no for two way. weeks. Yeah, I got two oh, weeks off. My. Yeah, yeah, two weeks off. So, so I'll tell you, so why we're on that two weeks off, I got another two weeks off. You'll love this one. So Christie was the U S attorney, you know, heavy set dude, actually a smart man, heavy set dude, political aspirations still out the S. So we had made, we had convicted, uh, via trial, a guy who was an authority, like a utilities authority chairman who was basically using the utilities authority as a bartering system to get work done on his house, his kids' house, his relatives' houses. And he couldn't understand that it was wrong. So we went to trial and we convicted him. It happened to be Chris Christie's 100th conviction in public corruption. So it was a big deal. You know, so we're kind of hanging out. And I go back to the U.S. Attorney's office and I'm talking and I'm telling jokes. And all these guys and girls are, are very young, Ivy League educated lawyers who um, loved hearing stories. And I'm telling story after story and joke. And they're laughing at everything, laughing at everything. And I go, hey, I got one more for you. And they're like, what's that? I said, how come the New York Yankees can't sign any more free agents? And they're like baffled what do, what do you mean i said because that fat fuck chris christie took all the pinstripes for his last suit <laughs> and silence silence so i go he's right behind you know so i turn around and he's like hey get your stuff and get out of here so i'm like Phew. i tried to apologize he didn't want any part of it get my car drive back long drive back to the office you know it's only about three miles but it felt like it was about two years oh. get back there i walk up secretary's like hey the boss wants to see you so i walk in who was the boss and, uh, it was this great, great dude. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to say his name because he's still working. But okay. great dude. A great dude. We got along great. And I walk in and he's like, say it. I'm like, you know, I did. He's like, uh, funny as hell. Um, <laughs> you're suspended. 
to this day, and I and I know Chris, so I see him from time to time. He'll just look at me and just shake his head, like he still hasn't gotten over it. <laughs> yeah. yeah.